Hold and the on, nurse... we have to roll the the telephone over to him. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, I'm coming. It needs some WD-40 back. I'm almost there. Welcome to Midsummer Maniacs. I'm Sarah. Hey, Maniacs. I'm Mark, and this is Midsummer Maniacs, a podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week, we dig into a particular episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else that we love. Because we love all of that stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> We're maniacs about all that stuff. Just before we begin with Season 4, Episode 2, the, our little disclaimer is that if you let your kids watch the show, they'll be able to listen to the podcast. But if the show is too much for your kids, the podcast certainly will be too. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking about Season 4, Episode 2, Destroying Angel. But before we dive into that... I got a little story. So as I'm working on all these episodes and editing and all this, I was working on last week's episode, Garden of Death, season four, episode one. And I realized that at the end of the episode, after all the murder and the mayhem happens, the Ink Pen Manor and Ink Pen Gardens now belongs to the gardener. Daniel. And Naomi Ink Pen, the old lady, has nowhere to live and no money. Right. I mean, maybe she stays in the in the estate, but only if he lets her. I'm I'm willing to watch a sitcom of that. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel and Naomi. <laughs> like that's not. Is he going to set up a still in the kitchen? She couldn't hate him more than oh. she does. <laughs> is he going to try to get it on with her? Oh. <laughs> Okay, to get that image out of my head. So once we started talking about that, about what happens after Tom and Troy leave, you know, the, yeah. the bad guys are, are locked up, the bodies have been taken away, kind of after the credits, what happens? And yeah, certainly in Garden of Death, there's a very interesting situation that's kind of left situation. over after everything. And, the and gardener would have to hire a gardener. Yeah. <laughs> So that got me thinking, are there other episodes that we've already talked about where after the credits, there is a weird situation left behind? There's got to be. And there's always going to be some kind of mayhem left behind. I mean, it's, it's seldom let at the end of the midsummer. It's like, and the bad guys are now locked up and the people who died were bad anyway. And so really the world's a better place. And on we go. It's not that kind of situation. No. So there's a couple that kind of stand out to me. In season two, we have Death's Shadow, right? Where this is the episode where um, Tom and Joyce are going to renew their vows at St. Michael's Church back in Badger's Drift. And the vicar is a killer and then commits suicide at the end in front of his wife yes and now the the estate issue that the um the initial victim of that episode right he's the, the realtor and he he owns the estate and whatever and he's selling it off from badger's drift all that goes to a relative in australia yeah that's that's kind of wrapped up but what's not wrapped up is the situation at saint michael's because i pity the vicar who comes in to replace that vicar oh so you, you want me to be the new vicar in Badger's Drift? Okay. What happened to the old vicar? Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> What's this spot here in the grass? Oh, that's the last vicar. Don't worry about oh, it. Oh, and wait a minute. The steeple is still crap and yeah. the roof is still <laughs> off. <laughs> and there's, there's a grumpy widow just lurking around. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to criticize the new one. <laughs> All she's going to do now is criticize Stephen for killing himself in front of her. Yeah, basically. Oh, uh, so what else? <laughs> so Dead Man's Eleven, okay, which is the, the, cricket. the cricket episode. Yeah. yeah. We've got Robert Cavendish at the very end sitting at the dining room table. He's been drugged. He's been stabbed. But I think we can safely assume that he does survive because the Barnaby's on his way. He knows what's going to happen. But his wife is dead. Yes. Right? And so the folks who are left, the Cavendish who are left, are Robert, his son, Stephen, Stephen and his wife, Jane. Jane, who they, their marriage is in tatters. They're in tatters. And Robert was going to sell the estate anyway and kick them out. Yeah. So what happens after that? And they have no help either. No, no staff. Because <laughs> Robert's going to be stuck eating puddings. 
I because guess. that's all Jane likes. <laughs> Puddings for everybody. And then one more, uh, which I think is probably the most fun, other than Daniel and Naomi living in the in the mansion together, is, <laughs> is Beyond the Grave, where we have... So Sandra was married to David yes. and his brother Charlie. David, David and Charlie delighted, departed. departed. Um, they own the software company together, right? David's yep. dead. Charlie's going to jail. So Sandra is left being the sole owner of the software company. She is the least likely owner of a software company. (laughs) What are they going to do now? (laughs) They're just going to make Scream, Scream, Run, Run software. I guess so. (laughs) (laughs) Or or maybe they'll... they'll, um, hook up with Mrs. Bunsel and they'll, Miss Bunsel, sorry, uh, and they'll start making like ghost detective software or seance software where Something. you can, you wave, maybe it's haptic. Maybe you wave your hands really weirdly at your computer and stuff happens. I had a really good uh, discussion online about Mrs. Bunsel this week with the folks on Facebook. Yeah. Because everybody seemed to love her and I posted about unwords. What was your favorite? My favorite unword was Brexit. <laughs> To which I responded, if you guys hate that word, we like we hate Brexit already. I'll the, trade you Brexit for Trump. Uh, I don't know. No deal there. <laughs> <laughs> so this episode, season four, episode two, is Destroying Angel. I have to say, this may be one of my favorite episodes. I love this episode. It has all sorts of weirdness in it. It's hard to have a favorite episode. Like, I have less favorite episodes. Yeah. But... It's hard to have the favorite episode. Oh, it's, it's yeah. definitely hard to have the but favorite. It's, but it's up there. You're right. Yep. Uh, it was filmed in July, August of 2000 and broadcast the 26th of August, 2001, with 9.99 million viewers once again. Directed by David Tucker, who is kind of a journeyman television director guy. He does a lot of EastEnders now, but he's done everything. And David Hoskins, who basically writes Midsummer's and The Bill. Really, he has my dream job. <laughs> Maybe that's why they have all the same actors. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> he, ke- he keeps them, you know, in a, in a hotel somewhere locked up and lets them out to be in one of his shows and that's it. <laughs> exactly. The village is Midsummer Magna. Now, I looked up Magna to see what it meant. It Mm -hmm. just means mighty or big, right? So So this is a big village. This is a big village. Or at least they want to be a big village. And we start with with Gregory Chambers, a man, a complicated man, Mm -hmm. walking in the woods. So you don't like mushrooms. No. I do like mushrooms, but after hearing Gregory Chambers talk about them, I don't know that I like them Uh, anymore. It's not good. My notes... Well, the biggest part of my notes just says, ew, because the way he describes them just, ugh. It's not academic. It's uh, something else. He talks about nodules and ripeness, right? Because he's talking into his recorder, his cassette recorder, and that there's a clear liquid from the incision. It's okay. just gross. It's a mushroom, dude. They're good in scrambled eggs. They're good on steaks. Leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> Just nasty. And he knows all the Latin names. And yeah. They're perfect freshness. Oh. <laughs> but um. we see Killer Cam, and we know when we see Killer Cam, there's a killing about to happen. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> He's out there alone in the woods. He's not going to make it. And he does this weird fall where he kind of takes a couple of steps backwards and then falls. Yeah. And we find out why this is later. Right. But I imagine the cameraman, though, basically on the ground with his camera and the actor falling backwards at him. That's exactly what they would have done. Like a nest tee plunge that yep. we used to do into the pool. That's what you called it. And it wouldn't have been pleasant. We're sent to the Easterly Grange Hotel, which is never mentioned. They never say the name of the hotel. It's just a sign. Yeah. But I'd like you to know that it gets four stars. From two organizations, one being AA, and I don't know the other one. I tried to look it up. (laughs) You think AA is supposed to be kind of like the AAA? Yeah, something. Yeah. But it it, got four stars. It's four stars twice on the sign. Obviously, it's a very fancy hotel. They have a chef. But today, it's the site of a funeral, right? There's a church right next to it. Yeah. (laughs) Where there's a funeral. That's the convenience of having murders in villages is everything is located really close together, right? Yeah. Today, the hotel is a dark, sad place because Carl Wainwright, the owner of the hotel, has died. And the help can go see him if the lid's not been screwed down yet. This according to Susanna. That's not the issue with screwing in the coffin. (laughs) 
Because two seconds later, Susanna and Tristan are making out on top of the dead body, basically. Okay, it's beyond making out. Teenagers make out. They're trying to eat each other's face. <laughs> and she has a thing for his stomach. With a corpse in the room. Yeah. That's not okay. A corpse that she killed. <laughs> yeah, that's true. When he was there to see it. Right from the beginning, even before you know about the conspiracy and what actually killed Carl Wainwright, right off the bat, you know that Susanna is reprehensible. She's bad news. That Tristan isn't any better. Nope. And and they're just two of a whole cast of people who really are not good people at all. I have a note that says, we get right to the rumpy pumpy. <laughs> It's just distasteful all over the place. You know who else is at this funeral? The Barnabys. Why? <laughs> Why are the Barnabys at this funeral? I don't know. I guess because the, the Carl Wainwright was a prominent person. Now, Evelyn and her husband, no choice, but how is this in any way related to the Barnabys? Yeah, certainly the Barnabys stretch. wouldn't go to the funeral because they wanted to support their friends who were going to the funeral. They're grown-ass adults. They don't need people to come with them. But maybe because they host the fate there. Maybe. Maybe Joyce Joyce's many volunteer activities have involved that fate. But Joyce has taken over Woody's cro- uh, croquet stand. Yeah. At the FET. And as soon as it said as as fate. fate, in my notes, <laughs> someone's going to die. Yeah. <laughs> There's a fate. We've already got one dead body <laughs> right off the bat. <laughs> We've got one in a casket. So now we're already at two dead bodies in this episode. Not and gonna... now they say there's going to be a fate. There's going to be more. There's you gonna know. There's going to be lots. <laughs> And Evelyn used to do the Punch and Judy show. Right. Now, okay, two-minute primer for our American listeners. Punch and Judy show is a far bigger thing than you realize in England. It, it is a British tradition that goes way, 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 back. way back. Some of the original comic books in the 19th century were in a magazine called Punch, which had Punch on the cover. He's comical. And that magazine is called Punch because he was already that recognizable. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, I think Punch and Shakespeare are contemporaries. I, I would agree. But Punch is not a nice fellow. No. No, 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 no. It's a controversial plot, right? So when you see Punch and Judy performed, the puppeteer who performs it is uh, is called a professor. Yes. That's what they call the puppeteer. And there is a standard traditional storyline about Punch and his wife, Judy, and how she's an idiot and he is chaos incarnate, right? He throws the baby out the window. He throws their baby out the window and then... A policeman, and, and then he kills Judy. Yep. Then a policeman comes to arrest him and to hang him. And Punch plays dumb and says, I don't know what to do with the noose. How do you do that? And the hangman sticks his head in. The policeman or the hangman stick their head in. And then Punch hangs them instead. And everybody cheers for Punch. Even though they he's do. a murderer, he's chaotic, he's he's evil. He's a child killer and an abuser. Yeah. He's a bully, too. And yet, he's this... I don't think anybody in, in the UK says, oh, Punch is a good guy. He's That's, an anti-hero. He's an anti-hero, but he, his character is a loved character because it's a tradition that goes way, way back. And right? he always turns the audience and goes, That's the way you do it. Right. Like, in you, that you're with me. Swazzle voice. So, a swazzle. Oh, gosh. We went down a rabbit hole trying to get a swazzle. It's a, if, if you know what a, um, a kazoo sounds like, yes. if you can imagine a very small kazoo like thing that you put in your mouth between your tongue, the back of your tongue and the roof of your mouth, and you hold it there while you talk, it makes this kind of vibratory, high-pitched voice come along with your voice. They're illegal here, right, in the U.S. You can't get them. You can't. I, yeah. I, I tried. I wanted to get one. Because I was going to use it. I even thought about making one, because there are some instructions online. Yeah. If anybody's crazy enough to do it, but the... The tradition is that you can't really be considered a professor until you've accidentally swallowed at least two swazzles. And then, because uh, they to are tell small, you, I have to tell you, I thought about passing a swazzle, and it was upsetting. And decided not to try to make one. Yes. <laughs> So she does the Punch and Judy show, or did the Punch and Judy show, but yeah. she's moving on. But what well, she Evelyn, also did... Evelyn is sick. 
Yeah. Right. We don't know exactly what's wrong with her, but she's definitely weaker. She uses a cane. Everybody's concerned about her. She's she's on the decline. And so she's no longer going to be the professor. And she's famous for using the Punch and Judy show for social commentary. Right. Which, again, village, is a tradition. Which is another tradition. There's that age old plot that is the Punch and Judy plot. But then it, it's common for professors to play around with that a little bit and make commentary about current events. So she's going to pass it on to Gregory. Though she doesn't know Gregory's dead. Right. Julia Gooders arrives at the funeral with her husband, Kenneth. Now, these are two people also involved with the hotel, but Kenneth is only interested in the sports on the radio. It's a cricket game. Yes. That apparently is incredibly important because Troy's listening to it, too, at the station. It, it actually leads to a special credit at the end of the episode because in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way... Now, so this is an ITV show. The the crazy credit at the end is test match commentary by kind permission of BBC Radio 5 Live. I doubt they actually asked for permission. I'm sure they did. Why would they say no? I think they kind of did that tongue in cheek because BBC is a competitor. Well, it's clear that Kenneth is more interested in the cricket match than the funeral which upsets Julia, but what doesn't upset Julia? Really, uh, she's on edge already. She's almost screamy, screamy, runny, <laughs> runny. She's just kind of runny, runny. Maybe hand flap runny, runny. She's screamy, <laughs> screamy too. <laughs> Later, yeah. Wainwright's nurse tries to get in, and Susanna's having none of it. Because we already know she's a horrible human being, so why not do something else horrible? She says, you can't come. If you were a good nurse, if you were doing your job, Carl wouldn't be dead. That's not true, pillow face over person. (laughs) (laughs) Murderer. Like the audacity to tell someone who actually cared about him... She, you can, you have to leave knowing that you're the one who killed him. Susanna is almost killed by her own cognitive dissonance. <laughs> she she may be one of the worst human beings in a midsummer to this point. So far, certainly, she has absolutely no moral compass, and her motive is just greed. And she's upset that she couldn't change the hotel. Yeah. She's not righting a wrong. She's not revenging something even that didn't happen, but she thinks it did. She's just greedy. power and money. Yeah. He died on the 14th of July, 2000 at the age of 81. But enough about the hotel. Yeah. (laughs) She says that in her eulogy. She gives the eulogy of the man like she has no moral compass no. at all. She even complains about how he kept it too cold. Say something nice. Yeah, exactly. After the funeral, the Pope's Woody and Evelyn invite Tom and Joyce back to their place. I love Woody. Yes. He's almost as good as Marcus. He's he's the Marcus of this episode. I just want to hug him. Marcus knew what was going on. Yeah. Woody's a little out there. But only because he's a kind guy, not looking too closely at stuff. I don't know. Speaking of closely, he sure pulls Joyce awful close. <laughs> I think it's fun that he flirts with her. Yeah, I think so too. And they have someone visiting them, Clarice or Clarice. Yeah. <laughs> Here we would say Clarice. Clarice. Yeah, it always makes me think of Silence of the Lambs because it's the only other character that I know who named named Clarice. But they pronounce it Claris, so we should say Claris. As and weird as it is feels, <laughs> creepy from the very beginning. She's she, got the puppets on her hand already, and she weirds me out even when she doesn't have the puppets. She's Evelyn's niece, and her parents live in Africa somewhere, Kenya, Kenya. So she's she's come to stay with them. I don't know how old she's supposed to be. The actress is in her 20s. We think that she's supposed to be mid to late teenage years. I I think that's what they want us to believe. Yes. Maybe late teens and maybe raised by parents who were missionaries or something else, some kind of sheltered life because... Well, Evelyn makes a comment that Clarice, sorry, Clarice doesn't know the impact she has on the opposite sex. Yeah. And she's certainly old enough to know about boys. And she certainly knows what she's doing to Troy, other than weirding him out. Yeah. At first I thought, oh, they're making eye contact. And then his face changes and he's like, yeah, you're pretty but scary and and weird and maybe crazy. Barnaby helps them load the 
the traditional puppet show theater into the van, the Scooby van, as we'll discuss later. The fate and the funeral are not on the same day. No. The, the fate is the next day, this right? Is, this is not the fate. This oh, it's is, a birthday party. It's a birthday party. That's right. So while they're doing that, they're having the will reading. Yes. Right? And the result of the will, which Kenneth reads... Because he's the lawyer of the hotel. Right. Is that Susanna, Gregory, Julia, and Tristan will each have a quarter share in the hotel. Now, there's a guy... They, there's a bunch of workers in the background. Mm-hmm. Including, and I immediately I'm like, it's that guy mm-hmm. who is uh, Tyson in this show, who is in King's Crystal, also another episode. And he plays basically the same guy. Yeah, he's he's kind of that tough, ticked off worker guy. Yes, that's what he is. <laughs> but the whole cast is there. I mean, everybody's everybody's there. There's a little bit of time difference. I, I guess I, I don't think it really impacts too much, except that we know. While this is happening, Gregory is dead in the woods, right? So. Well, no, he's dead in the drink. Well, yes. Yes. He's been killed. Yes. He is dead. So Annie is at the reading. Yes. She's at the funeral. She's at the will reading. But then when Evelyn and Claris and Tom are in the van taking the Punch and Judy show to the birthday party, she's at the end of the lane having caught pheasants in the woods. Now, I have a question. I have never been pregnant in my life. My entire life, I've never had this experience. (laughs) And Annie is four months pregnant at this point. Four months? Four months. We know it's Gregory's child, we find out. Yeah. Were you really wanting to go... Now, I realize you had triplets. Did you want to go pheasant hunting at four months pregnant? I I wouldn't have gone pheasant hunting if I had been 100 months pregnant or negative 100 months pregnant. There's no situation in which I would have said... I'm going to go pheasant hunting. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know. But she's definitely stressed out. Yes. The father of her child, the man she loves, is missing. And she was going to go meet him. In she the woods. was supposed to go to the funeral with him. They were yeah. going to go together, and yeah. that was going to be a big statement about the future that they were going to have together, despite Susanna, who he's married to, right? And so I can only imagine that after. The confusion and upset of that morning. She just wanted to do something that made her feel purposeful. But she's a busy four month pregnant lady. She is. But she's also kind of a woodsy, outdoorsy gamekeeper's daughter. So who knows? Maybe pheasant hunting is relaxing to her. Yes. And Tyson's her dad. Those two are. Whew. Yeah. So Troy starts working the missing person and he's calling around the hospitals and stuff like that. And what happens is Barnaby and Claris and a few other people go to the pub and they go to the Red Lion, which is the actual name of that pub. And this is after the show, yes. right? At the birthday party? Yeah. So I have a question about that show Sorry. before, before we go too far on, because we've talked about the swazzle and all that stuff. So Gregory was supposed to do this Punch and Judy show, yes. right? But he's missing. Yes. So Claris does it instead. Yes. Evelyn encourages her, says, you can do it. And she does a pretty good job. She drops a puppet, but she's a natural mimic. Yeah. Knowing what we know about how that swazzle works and how all the research I've done, I couldn't find a single instance of a professor who didn't use a swazzle to yes. do Punch's voice. Yes. Claris is alone in the puppet show. She's got a puppet on each hand and yet is able to do a normal voice and then a swazzle voice and then a normal voice without dropping, without lowering a puppet to have her hand free to take it out of her mouth or put it back in her mouth. The answer, strangely enough, is Greenland. And by that, I mean, they recorded the audio later. (laughs) I know, but how... How is she supposed to be doing Oh, it? I have no idea. Like you put it in your teeth or something? Or maybe or in your cheek? In your cheek. I'd, I'd, I'd really like to meet a traditional professor and ask these questions. All I know is every time I... And, and this is not the first time that I've thought about Punch and Judy because Punch and Judy is mentioned in so many different things. It is an incredibly difficult thing to do. I can only imagine using two different puppets that are both above your head and doing the swazzle, not the swazzle, even if you're just putting it in the side of your mouth and back. It's going to be tiring and physical. Too. Without swallowing it, while doing the motions, with a bunch of grumpy kids sitting outside. Yeah. 
definitely. <laughs> like, and, you know, because she's accomplished this achievement, Evelyn is so proud of her, she takes a Polaroid of her performing the Punch and Judy show where you can't even see Clarice because she's behind the curtain. <laughs> like, here's you doing your first performance. I'm so proud of you. I know you're not in this picture, <laughs> and it could be anybody in this picture, but I'm so proud. So that Polaroid camera is a Polaroid 636 Blue. Blue? Yes, because the camera itself is blue and only available in the UK. Oh. That blue model. You couldn't buy that model here in the United States. And it was actually still in use at this point in time. You still could buy film and stuff for it, even into 2000. It's hard not to see that Polaroid and think, Wow, that's a really antiquated camera. So you're saying, but at the time, it really wasn't? At the time, it wasn't as antiquated. I just thought it was great that Evelyn takes the photo of Claris. <laughs> It's like going on vacation and never taking a picture of you or your family anywhere you go, just taking pictures of stuff. Yes. You know, like, Were you on the vacation? It could be anybody. <laughs> so they go down the pub and... The landlady does it like a good thing. She calls out and says, anybody seen Gregory? Because Evelyn and Claris actually want to know where Gregory is. Meanwhile, Julia's like, eh, who cares? I'm late for the decorators. Let me touch your stomach. <laughs> Not only is she horrible, bad, immoral, greedy, but she doesn't even pretend not to be. No, none of those things. <laughs> she doesn't even fake like, oh, I wonder where my husband is. She's like, who cares? Whatever. And Peter's playing dominoes and he kind of yells out that Gregory's found another woman. And I think they imply here that Clarice or somebody close to Clar uh, Clarice is that other woman. I kind of got that impression too. But then when I think about how young I think she's supposed to be, that that's kind of gross. And it and everybody is She definitely looks up to him. Everyone's immediately serious when they find out Gregory didn't do the Punch and Judy show. Yeah. Like he wasn't at the funeral. Oh, well, he's off, you know. Yeah. But, but he didn't do Punch and Judy. Oh, that's serious. We better go look for him because he's dedicated to it, right? I mean, it, yeah. that, that just shows that it's meaningful to him. So they go looking in the woods. They get the party out. Everybody in the, in the pub pours out to go help. And a dog finds a hand. Yes. Just a hand. And the theremin wails. That's so. <laughs> That's so, what the subtitle so says. So we watch all these shows with the clo closed captioning on because, first of all, uh, I'm, my hearing isn't as good as it used to be. And second of all, these these people speak English, but sometimes... Every once in a while you get an accent that's kind of... And they say stuff really fast yeah. sometimes. I did some research on the theremin player for Midsummer. Her name is Celia Sheen. We should have talked about her way back when. We should have. Because hasn't she always played the theremin for the yes. theme song? And she died in 2011. Oh. She was 71. But Jim Parker said this. Jim Parker does the music for the episodes. That she uh, played this instrument that was made in the 1920s. And it played in the series for 15 years. She also played all the violin parts. So if you hear a violin, that's her also performing that. She was also on a number of soundtracks for Hollywood films, including Spellbound and The Day the Earth Stood Still. Wow. Like, these are really kind of cool films. And worked in concerts and recordings with Frank Sinatra, Poli uh, Placido Domingo, Cliff Richard, and many other known performers. She's super cool. And if you've never seen a theremin played, I highly encourage you to go to YouTube and watch somebody play the theremin. It's amazing. They, so they don't touch it. The theremin that she is shown at, you know, I've watched a couple of videos, is a theremin that's like nine grand. Mm -hmm. It's super duper. The guy who created the theremin, tiny little aside, is this Russian scientist who almost created it on accident. His last name was Theremin. Mm -hmm. And he came to the United States to show that technology to RCA and stole a bunch of their technology for the KGB and took it back to Russia. <laughs> so did he trade us a Theremin for... A bunch of RCA secrets. <laughs> Basically. He's like, at this point look, time, look at this weird instrument. Meanwhile, he's like grabbing blueprints. <laughs> that's basically what happened. And RCA was like a leader at the time. And then another tiny little aside, the whole ther theremin kind of disappeared until Moog brought it back, the guy who created synthesizers, because he, he brought it back into Hollywood. And that's how we get all the Hollywood woo 
Ooh, yeah. alien movie stuff. So it's it's an amazing instrument, and it Midsummer wouldn't be Midsummer without it. Yes, absolutely. It's it it is the main theme is a waltz with a weird kind of voicey theremin noise over it, and it perfectly sums up the show. And in situations like this. When they find the hand and you hear that theremin sound, it it sets the mood perfectly. It sets the mood in a way that a violin just it would just wouldn't. Yeah, so it, especially in this series. Yeah, theremin comes in perfectly here, and then there's a crappy sound edit. It like it doesn't dissipate naturally. Just there's cuts no off. decay. It just cuts off. <laughs> it's just bad. George says the hand is Gregory's, and it's been cut off with a hacksaw. Who does that? Well, apparently Tristan. Ugh. Susanna is the manager of the hotel. Tristan is the head chef. Julia is the accountant. Kenneth is... The lawyer. The lawyer. And Gregory was general help. Yeah. He just helped around the place. Did you think he he got paid? I don't know, but the old man liked him the most. Yeah. So now that Claris is going to be the official Mr. Punch professor, Mm. Evelyn gives her a new Mr. Punch puppet. Trust Mr. Punch. Why would you ever trust Mr. Punch? I wouldn't trust Mr. Punch with a glass of water. He'd splash it in your face and then stab you with the glass. <laughs> Puppets are creepy anyway, okay? Let's just put that out there. They can be very creepy. They're not always creepy, These but they can creepy. be. These are purposefully monstrous puppets. Yeah. Their their features are extreme. So the last thing we need is Clarice, a girl who's slightly creepy all by herself, to now have a puppet that is super creepy that she insists on wearing all the time. And she doesn't blink and nor does Mr. Punch. You know what's weird also is Colin rushes home when they find out about the hand to talk to Florence, his housekeeper. That's a nice name for what she is. (laughs) I wonder if he pays her. He's a naughty boy. He's, they'll find out how naughty you've been. Mm -hmm. Susanna doesn't hide the fact that she's greedy or immoral or adulterous. She's like, yeah, I've been sleeping with Tristan for eight months. Before that, Troy makes maybe his most tasteless joke in the entire series so far. That he would have had to do the Judy show instead of the the Punch punch and Judy. The Judy show because he lost a hand. Because they don't know if he's dead or not, right? He does a little hand motion. It's fantastic. He pulls his sleeve over his hand. It's tasteless, but it's funny. (laughs) So she admits that they were having an affair. Um, She also says that she was in the woods that morning, the morning that Gregory died. So apparently the woods were crowded that morning. She she says that Gregory had no enthusiasm for, I guess. For sex. For sex. This is the second episode of this show in which a woman who is married to a man has said, well, he's not enthusiastic enough to have enough sex for me, so I'm just going crazy. Because <laughs> the vet's wife was like that. It too. makes me nuts. I don't know what they're trying to say with that. <laughs> Susanna was in the forest. Kenneth was in the forest. Tristan was in the forest. Everybody's in the forest the morning that Gregory dies. And when Tom and Troy go into the forest... They pass a sign on the side of the road put yes. there by the police that says there was an incident here. If you have information, call on, this number. On 2307-2000. And it has a number. Mm-hmm. So they have the date of the incident. So you're driving by on British roads going Mach 10 because, you know, it takes forever to get half an hour someplace. Yeah. And you're supposed to be like, oh, what was that phone number? <laughs> Crash. When I saw that sign, I just thought, wow, if they put those up everywhere there was an incident, Midsummer would be covered with them. <laughs> but I guess they take them away once they solve the crime. Absolutely. Otherwise, you couldn't drive for hitting one of those signs. They also talk to the Gooders before this. Mm-hmm. And Troy notices that uh, Kenneth Gooder has an MCC tie on. So that is the Marleybone Cricket Club. Cricket Club phone uh, founded in 1787, and it's kind of London's cricket team. Oh, okay. And they're very popular. It's that yellow and red stripy. I figured that was an old school tie. No. It's a no. cricket club tie, yeah, huh? Marleybone, which is just a great name of an area in London, Marleybone. <laughs> and he tells his wife to take a pill. <laughs> wow. By there's, the way, there's not enough pills for Julia. Yeah. By the way, what's the score? Yeah. It's cricket. So it's 115 to 44, and they're on a tea break. Yeah. <laughs> And we still don't know who's winning. (laughs) 
Tom and Troy suspect that maybe the body's in the pond, so they're out there looking around. And Annie goes home to her father. And wow. Oof. He is... Talk about Punch and Judy. Punch and Judy right here. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. He says all this sort of under his breath stuff, and she just freaks out and starts to beat him up. Well, it's not just stuff under his breath. I think he's insinuating that Gregory sort of deserved it. Yes. That he's dead. He planted his seed and he ignored it. Yeah. Well, we know that Gregory didn't, but he could say that. And, And he's definitely stirring up trouble. Yes. Annie's dad. And Barnab- she smashes an antique chair against him yep. and breaks it. Barnaby <laughs> and Troy show up and he's like, my damn daughter. <laughs> so we have this image of Annie as like a wild animal. And he know? lets it out that Gregory got Annie pregnant. Mm-hmm. Which gives her a motive. And he goes, I should have killed him. And I was in the woods, but it wasn't me. But I didn't see any of those other people who were all in the woods at the same time. You know who you should talk to is Colin Slater. He's always talking about denuding the woods. <laughs> <laughs> get it? Get it? Huh? Huh? <laughs> get it? Get it? Denuding? <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite scenes when they go to Colin's door to talk to him, and he answers the door wearing nothing but an apron, socks, and sandals. Okay, so this is a well-known midsummer scene. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Right? It is weird, rumpy, pumpy. It's fetishistic. It's strange. And it's comical. Mm-hmm. Okay? I became obsessed with the poster beside the door. <laughs> You're such a weirdo. <laughs> the kid... <laughs> Okay, okay, so Roger Frost, the actor who plays Colin. Yes. We have full on, it's not frontal nudity, it's it's, it's the opposite. You've it's, seen more of his butt cheeks back than nudity. anybody else naked in this show so his, far. His ass is half of the screen and you're looking at a poster next to him. Absolutely. Good I'm for you. Way okay. into the poster. Okay, what about that poster? So the poster is for Symposium 2000 of Tropical mycology which is the study of mushrooms at liverpool john moore university the 25th to the 29th of may 2000 this was a real conference whoa i saw the real posters and read the real notes of this conference okay i'm saying whoa for two reasons (laughs) one amazing that the set dressers actually got a real poster from a real event absolutely and two whoa i can't believe you spent so much time looking into that poster (laughs) (laughs) did you learn anything it was like a two-day conference uh, no a four-day conference on mushrooms in tropical areas well yeah liverpool is this huge microbiology center because colin is a mushroom expert, yes, right? Yes, he is. He's a botanist or something like I that. I think he's an academic at yeah. this point, too. And as a fellow academic, that is not the weirdest focus of a conference I've ever heard. But I've never put a, a poster. Now, it's a nice poster. It looks nice. I've been to a lot of conferences. I've yep. keynoted large conferences, and I've never brought a poster home and no. framed it. No, absolutely not. But anyway, you should phone and make an appointment. Goodbye. <laughs> Isn't that what you would say? Exactly. Or would you walk backwards in your apron and nothing else so that you didn't expose yourself and let them into the house and then sit on the furniture bare-ass naked, No, right? don't worry. We get a lot more bare-ass naked with Colin, so... Roger Frost is a brave Brave, actor. brave He actor. runs naked in this episode. Yeah, and there is a close-up of his ass and bouncing bits. That's <laughs> all I'm going to say. So Roger Frost has been married to the same person for a very long time. He's married to Pam Ferris, yes. who plays Laura Time and yes. Rosemary and Time. Yep, yep. I uh, did. He was also in um, the TV mini- miniseries for Terry Pratchett's Hogfather. Yes. He played the Bursar in that. Uh, that's cool. He's really good. Yep. And he's in Time Bandits, he's, where he gets killed twice. He's in Time Bandits, where he plays Cartwright, who is the one minion for evil who's like, Wait a minute. God made you, so it... Uh, uh, and then evil kills him. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Lasers. Like, he's the one who makes sense. <laughs> yeah. While the other ones are just sick so, of fans. So he certainly can't survive. Yes. But very brave actor. <laughs> so they go tell Susanna about the baby. She's nauseated by that, but not even 
Colin could kill over mushrooms, she says. No. He wanted the woods to himself. He likes it out in the open. <laughs> Denuding. <laughs> Meanwhile, Annie's burning stuff. They go to see her, and she's got a fire going. And they say, well, what are you burning? And she says, some of Gregory's clothes. She, never mind the fact that she didn't start the fire or put the clothes on the fire. She doesn't say that. No, nope, no. Nope. Oh, and what's so in she her gets truck? Arre- a bunch of blood. So she gets arrested because it. she looks super guilty. And then she's just so upset. She's too sad and yeah. angry. and Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of blood in the back of her truck. Yes. But apparently it's not pheasant blood or fox blood or any other things that she probably puts dead things in the back of her truck. So they go off to see the professors. and Because I have, we haven't been creeped out enough. I have the following line in my note. Claris entices Troy in a sexual way with the punch puppet. <laughs> Well, if there's this inner cut, right? Her eyes, his eyes, her eyes, his eyes. And you're like, wow, maybe there's a love connection. And then the camera pans from her eyes to Punch's eyes. <laughs> and then she's and then back to Troy and he's like, to Punch Ugh. like he's a ventriloquist dummy. <sighs> Forget about what happens in this scene. She's just so incredibly weird. And I guess Evelyn just thinks, well, she's got to practice. I guess. She's not weird. It's She's just practicing. And Evelyn's sickly. Like, that's the entirety of this scene. Weird Clarice, a Polaroid, and Evelyn's sickly. What I wrote down is, Troy either likes Clarice or fears the puppet. And then I underlined, fears the puppet, and put a star. Like, (laughs) yep, that's the winner. (laughs) (laughs) This is also the scene where the Polaroid of the mushroom, Chicken of the Wood, falls out of her, her book. And they ask her why she has it. And she says, I'm trying to learn about fungi. Which is a weird way to say that. Yep. I've been trying to learn more about mushrooms. Yep. Or why? Gregor, why? Gregory's teaching me more. Was teaching me more about mushrooms, but I'm trying to learn more. Like, are you failing to learn more? I don't know. She's a weird woman. So it's just a strange way to say it. Killer Cam arrives again, but it's really Killer Post Cam because it delivers a bunch of notes that are handwritten. <laughs> it's galosh cam. Yes. It's galoshes. And also leaves some mushrooms. But completely innocently, remember? You know, it's not really the killer. Yep. It's somebody who just innocently is replacing some mushrooms. Yes. No big deal. And next thing you know, Tristan is spewing his guts. <laughs> that is some extended vomit noise. Colin is so fantastic in every scene, whether it's him being sure that he absolutely secures his piece of crap car. So the first low running Jack around scene. naked or this scene where he is the least sympathetic human being I've ever seen. <laughs> he, yep. <laughs> so the first scene with his low Jack, he puts it in the car and you could see it in the background falling off the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> but he just walks it man yeah He's, he goes he owns it this scene he does the same thing he owns it he's so good and then he's just so incredibly unsympathetic like tristan is dying and he's securing oh his, he knows tristan is not only dying car. he's gonna die a horrible death and he's like how did they taste because he knows he's never gonna taste one. yes he knows he's never gonna taste they're the forbidden mushroom on the third day there will be a remission and they're like but it's a false oh, one yeah Susanna and tristan are like oh thank heavens yeah but it's a false one it's, then you die it's basically already too late <laughs> and it's not a pleasant death everything i read about that mushroom it basically called causes all of your organs to just fail one your at a time entire system fails yeah and the fake remission like, that's like nature going, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Fooled you. Julia got some mushrooms, too. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> Though the next time we see her, she's clearly high. Like yeah. Like, she's on something. She's taken the advice to take the pills. I'm not really fond of puppets. <laughs> so let's get this straight. There have been, there's at least one murder that's already happened in the woods that included having hands cut off. Mushrooms have been slipped into somebody's breakfast and now they're dying. Everybody's had a death threat through the mail. And yet Kenneth says, oh, no one is trying to kill anybody. You're, it's all in your head. You're overreacting. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just like Kenneth could make himself look a little bit more guilty. Kenneth is horrible too, because he is the guy at the back that goes, yeah, kill him. He doesn't do anything. Kenneth does nothing in this episode except for watch murders and get 
crushed by Drake's cabinet. Well, when Julia comes back from the funeral or from the will reading, he seems excited about the fact that she's inherited a quarter of the hotel because that means he can buy more whiskey. Yes. Right? For his collection of whiskey. And so I... So when it falls on him, it is justice. So I think this murder is a first, though, in Midsummer Because when he goes to the drinks cabinet, in the room are him, his wife, Julia... And Troy and Tom. Yeah. This is the first murder I think Troy and Tom actually witnessed. Yeah. They're not just nearby, but no. they see it they happen. see the drinks cabinet go over slowly yeah. so that Kenneth can't get out of the way. <laughs> okay. They also... Okay. There are a lot of bottles on there. Mm-hmm. And they all have labels that are real. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming... That that's not actual alcohol. Right. Okay. It's colored water in there. Yeah. Somebody had to drink all that alcohol. (laughs) Was this a party set or something? Because there's a lot of alcohol. Maybe they collected them all from pubs. So the drinks cabinet goes down and Troy tries to lift it. And Barnaby's like, no, no, no. His hand. Takes his pulse. Clearly He's instantly dead. I don't know if he would instantly die. I don't think so. I don't think so either, but... Julia does, uh, what does she do again? Mm. Screamy, screamy. Yeah. (laughs) And those must have been the two most powerful screws in the universe. They held up really that entire wall. Apparently. And who goes, who calls the handyman? I know you're Richie Rich, but who calls the handyman to take two screws out? I don't know how he did it anyway. It's well established that this cabinet weighs a gazillion pounds, right? It's enough to instantly it? crush someone to death. Oh, they're paying me. I'm just going to make their house a pit. Of- no, Julia. He thinks that Julia called him and said that they were going to sell it at auction, and so they wanted it removed from the wall. But it was full. Yes. So how does he, the handyman of magical abilities, move this cabinet far enough away from the wall to take those screws out and then put it back without it falling on him. It's magic. If it's so teeter-tottery that just opening the door makes it fall and crush you to death. Magic. He's skilled. I guess so. Yep. We have no timeline on that either. No. Because he is in that drinks cabinet at other points. I'm like, does it fall on him now? Oh, no. Okay. So that timeline is weird. So now Kenneth's been crushed. Julia is even more freaked out. She... (laughs) They send her to bed, give her pills or whatever, and send her to bed. But then when everybody's outside, she comes out to talk to Susanna, and she says, I just don't think I can face the tombola. Yes. (laughs) And Julie and Susanna says, look it, we have two dead husbands and a poison lover between us. I think it's okay if we don't run the tombola. You weren't even supposed to run the tombola (laughs) anyway. (laughs) All I could think is roll up, roll up, (laughs) yeah. Because Tom runs the tombola, you know, in another episode. (laughs) Like, I can't face the tombola. Really, no one can, Julia. It's the tombola. It's not exciting. So they figure out that Annie couldn't have left the mushrooms because she was in the pokey. Mm Mm-hmm. And they go and see, this is just like a ping pong between suspects. That's all they do. They just keep, uh, Tom and Troy are just like, let's talk to this person. Let's go talk to that person. Oh, they're dead. So now we don't have to go talk to them anymore. We we have the... (laughs) The punch hangman scene, don't tease. And Gregory's script is mentioned, that they found Gregory's script. Because he was going to follow the tradition of making some kind of social commentary with his script for the show. So At the fate, not the show at the birthday party. As mentioned, they ping pong around all these different things, right? You know what Troy's doing in the car? He's calling the cop shop to tell them where they are. Every single time they So they can find them. Because they phone on a landline and know where he is. That was kind of how you had to do it. Oh, gosh. It must have been a pain in the butt. I don't know why they're doing it in this episode specifically when we already know that cell phones exist from prior episodes. Yeah. But detective inspectors, especially before cell phones, did call in quite often and tell the desk, tell the desk sergeant where Where they they were. were. It's time for the fate. Yep. Luckily... I have fate. Someone's going to (laughs) die. Actually, no one dies at the fate. No. But there is a who'd have thought it truck. What the heck is that? I mean, it's a food truck. Apostrophe D slash A comma T-H-O apostrophe T uh, dash I-T. Who'd have thought it? 
And they yeah. have everything. Chips, burgers, candy floss, toffee apples. Wait a minute, toffee apples? Is that like butter toffee on an apple? Because we're getting on a plane and going to the UK so I can have one of these All right I now. know is that we don't have any food trucks in Bloomington that are nearly as good as the Who'd Have Thought It truck. Because who'd have thought they'd have all that stuff? They also have another interesting thing there that I really want to know more about. Ferret racing? Ferret racing. (laughs) Place your bets. They've got Splat the Rat, too, but we know what that is. We know what Splat the Rat is. But but ferret racing. Ferret racing was a new one. Hey, (laughs) now. I'm like, I want to place my bet on the ferret racing. (laughs) Meanwhile, Susanna's like, all the builders... In the county, must come to the hotel right now. Start work. Yes. <laughs> it's the most efficient project. Because two days ago, she was meeting with decorators, and now Paint work is underway. Wall. Yep. Goodbye. She's on it. And this is the last time that the fate's going to happen at the hotel anyway. So, because she's already told those people that they're not going to be doing it again. They find out about, like, that Tristan's a really good archer. They find a piece of paper... No, in the woods, they find the mushroom and some blood, which has been there for a couple of days, but it's still wet. And there's a Punch and Judy show. Heads will roll if the truth ain't told. So then they get in the Scooby van. (laughs) The Punch and Judy van is the Scooby van? It kind of looks like it. Especially when all three of them are in the front seat. Yes. I like that. (laughs) I like like Tom riding in... Judy? (laughs) Tom (laughs) riding... When Tom's riding in the middle. (laughs) Roger Judy? (laughs) No Scoob, Scooby Snack. No Barnaby, have a Scooby Snack. (laughs) Barnaby? (laughs) Where's Shaggy? It's Troy. (laughs) Troy is Scooby. (laughs) So while running the hotel, Mm -hmm. while doing all these renovations, Mm -hmm. while touching Tristan's stomach, did you notice that as soon as Tristan goes to the hotel, goes to the hospital, she cares nothing about oh, him. She's over him. Like I can't touch his stomach because he's puking. Mm, he's not sexy anymore. He's not sexy anymore. I mean, if the person you loved had days to live, you knew they were going to die. Would you want to be anywhere else but by their side? No, you're in the workshop late at night making a spike strip. With hinges on it. Do you the think Julia meditation involved <laughs> in this? Because it's Susanna who puts the sp- the spike strip down. I'm not exactly sure why she wants to kill them, but she does because she thinks they know about the will because they, they've mentioned the piece of paper. So she has to leave early from the punch show, get ahead of the Scooby van, mm-hmm. put down the the spike strip. In broad daylight. Yep. In a spot where she thinks they'll kill it themselves. Because there's a wall they can run into. Because in no point in time does she think, oh, well, the air will go out of their tires and they'll slow down and stop. <laughs> well, Clarice is driving and she's crazy. That's true. Uh, she should have the punch button <laughs> on <laughs> as she's driving. <laughs> so it's... It's Evelyn, Barnaby, <laughs> the Punch Puppet, and Clarice. No, Tom's not in the van this time. But if we could but, just... But if, Scooby in the back. <laughs> so <Punch? laughs> there's great footage of Clarice and Evelyn kind of getting thrown left and right in the front of the van as they lose control after but they go over. But now I can see Punch going But if, if only it zoomed in and, and Punch was there in the middle, you know, <laughs> smiling, waving back and forth too, that would have been awesome. So they go off into a field. Oh, she should have driven with punch on her hand i can't get that out of my head now that would have been so epic (laughs) she's screaming evelyn's screaming punch is screaming (laughs) so after that suzanne calls julia and says calm down julia is definitely the weakest link in this conspiracy oh who is the weakest link julia Julia. (laughs) and then who calls next punch calls next man is there anything creeper creepier than punch calling you on the phone Ju- Julia needs caller ID. That's what my note says. <laughs> would it say punch? I think it would say punch. It would say killer punch. Evelyn. Uh, You're sorry. next. I'm coming to get you. So ah, That Julia would drive anybody crazy. <laughs> Husband's dead. She's out of her medicine. Punch Home is alone. calling her on the phone. Home alone after having a death threat too. 
Yes. And the, and the, the scene of her husband's death is like mm, d- downstairs. And we find out later that Tristan had called Suzanne to go, go kill her. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like, what does he care? He, he, there's the least characterized thing of him. When she calls him at the hospital for advice, Hold and the on. nurse... we have to roll the, the telephone over to him. <laughs> the thing, I'm coming. It needs <laughs> some <laughs> WD-40 <laughs> back. <laughs> I'm almost there. <laughs> <laughs> the excited nurse who gets to sit behind the window and watch Tristan die. And then I'm like, do they plug it into the wall? If they plug it into the wall, why don't they have a phone there already? <laughs> But she calls him because she's freaked out and she wants his advice. And if I was Tristan, I'm laying there in agony. I know I'm dying. She calls me going, oh, Julia is like so unstable. And I think she's going to like tell people that you we killed people. Knife kill her. Wouldn't you just say, um, screw you, Susanna, and hang up? Yeah. I would. Or it's time that you were over here because I'm dying. Maybe she'll kill you instead. Oh, wait, that's what happens. <laughs> Because that's what happens. So Julia, the least stable person in this entire episode, gets a gun. Always a bad thing. And knows that Susanna is going to kill her. Let's just go over. Wait a minute. Does she know Susanna's coming to kill her? She she knows someone's coming to get her. Let's just go over. Susanna kills Cartwright. Mm -hmm. Wainwright. Wainwright. Sleeping around on her husband. Mm -hmm. Ditches her lover the the moment he gets sick. Mm-hmm. Drives the nurse away and breaks her heart. Puts down the strip and goes over to kill Julia. She may be the the most maniacal person we've seen so far. And all because she's greedy. It's all greed. So anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Susanna goes down like a sack of potatoes. I can I can imagine though that there was another phone call that we didn't see. Okay, what's the what's the where other? Tristan called Julia again? Okay, and said. Susanna's coming to kill her. Oh. Kill you, shoot you her he shoot that? her first. Susanna would deserve it. Yeah. And if I was Tristan, yeah, what all you got to lose? Tristan has nothing to lose no. right now, which is why when the the cops go see him, when Bo- Tro- Troy and Barnaby go to see him, he gives it all up. Yeah, because right. he has nothing to lose. He's like, oh, here's the will. I was out with safety arrows. I'm sorry to go on and on about this, but... You could not shoot a safety arrow into a person, let alone a tree far across the water. No. It's just not possible. Yeah. You'd think, as much as they clearly know about weaponry and stuff for the show, that when they show the tip of an arrow, they would have shown a real arrow yeah. and then let him shoot a safety arrow. Because Tristan certainly would not have used the wrong arrows because he's Rambo. He says, I'll kill Gregory. I'll yeah. take that job. Right? Yeah. He volunteers. He's ready. He's ready. If only he had camo. Hmm. And face paint. Yeah. And fur boats. Yeah. <laughs> the armbands. Yeah. I understand. Those are archery gear. Yeah. Right. They stabilize your bicep to keep your arm from trembling when you're holding a an arrow taut for a long period of time. The camo pants. I kind of understand because they're cargo pants and they let him hold a bunch of stuff. Maybe he needed bits and pieces. Okay, maybe. They don't have to be camo. In the same way we have Punch in the van now in our brains, all the outdoor scenes, I see Tristan leaping like it's a gazelle in the background. Yeah, saying, if it bleeds, we can kill it. (laughs) Not only does he have all that gear on, he puts the black paint on his cheeks. He puts a feather in the headband. Yeah. Now he's real. He's ready. And he brings a raft. Does he inflate the raft? Uh, uh, There's a missing scene where he's on the beach... With the dead body. Yeah, no pump because he would have to carry it, right? No, he's blowing into it with his mouth. I should have brought a pump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that would have taken him half a day. But he was interrupted. Well, he has those awesome abs. He does. So maybe that lets him inflate a full size raft <laughs> with just his mouth. <laughs> he's interrupted by Colin <laughs> and his, his sandals. His sandals. <laughs> And the housekeeper doesn't appear here. No. You know she's there, but you don't see her. So Colin is nakedy naked. He yeah. has sandals on. No apron. That is no nothing. All he is on. And we get the moonshot, right? 
it takes up the whole screen, his ass. Yeah, never mind the branch that slaps him on the ass first while he's running. And the subtitles here are happy cries of pain. Yeah. (laughs) Whoever wrote the captions was having a lot of fun there. (laughs) Absolutely. Like, what do you say about that scene? And what, what the thing is that Colin does nothing wrong in this episode. No. I mean, he's kind of insensitive and overly protective of his car. And he has uh, has an interesting relationship with his... But he's not hurting anybody. He's not hurting anybody. No. He is a nice man. Mm -hmm. And if he could have helped Tristan, I think he would have. I think he would have, too. I think he absolutely would have. If there was an antidote, I think he would have gladly said so. Jeez, he gets a bad rap on the butt. But he likes it, so it's okay. <laughs> if only if only when the branch came out, because we don't see who's holding it, we just assume that it's Florence, but if only you just seen a little flash of punch <laughs> <laughs> holding the holding the branch. Just whacking it like his sticks. That's the way to do That's it. That's the way to do it. <laughs> I want to talk about blood. Okay. Okay, so we all know there was blood in the back of Annie's truck. Yes. And Tristan says that he put it there. And it came from... The head and hands of Gregory. From... The woods. What's his name's car. Right. So Tristan kills Gregory in the woods, cuts his head and hands off in order to... Because he's carrying a hacksaw in his combat trousers, apparently. He is. Along with the inflatable boat. He's got big pockets. Right? <laughs> Man, his face must have been so sore. You know when you blow up a pool floaty, you get that kind of lightheaded feeling if you blow it up too fast? He must have really been lightheaded. Anyway, so he cuts the head and hands off, puts them in a plastic trash bag, sinks the body. Drops a hand. Well, the bag rips apparently, so a hand falls out and he doesn't notice. But the bag is still whole enough to contain all of the blood that's oozing out of the head and the remaining hand. In the Ken's car. So he puts it in Ken's trunk, and it leaks blood in there, and then they think, oh, we should put blood in the back of Annie's truck so that it looks like she transported the body. And when they show Annie's truck, it's not like a little spatter or a couple of drops. There's it's like a, a puddle, There's right? a puddle of blood. So how do you get from a blood pool in Ken's car to a blood pool in the truck? Like, did he sop it up with a dishcloth and then wring it out in the back of Annie's I, car? I guess. Maybe he had those also. Or maybe he could have filled a floaty with it. <laughs> or maybe he, he brought Gregory's head to the truck and, like, squeezed it. Maybe. Like a lemon? No, they did that afterwards. Because remember, he puts that stuff in the incinerator. That's right. Which would have left all sorts of evidence. Yeah, but they don't look real thoroughly in there. As far as we know, Barnaby just kind of scoots no, stuff make around. No, they a reference that, to it later that the lab boys went through it. Ah, yes. Behind the scenes, the grunts did the work. With their white sticks. So did they use like a wet wet vac to vacuum the blood out Maybe. of Kenneth's carpet and then and then pour that out? And it, it, just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And it seems like an awfully big, messy kind of thing. It's, and wouldn't Annie have noticed that Tristan's out there like squeezing blood into the back of her truck? Like, and when did they do it? Oh, it's just the the timeline here is screwy. Just the reality of it is really gross. Yeah. You know, it makes me think of like Strangler's Wood when we know that little boy went out there with his dad's shirt and smeared it over a corpse's lips to get lipstick on it. You know, it's like, that's a nice clue. But if you think about the logistics of it, it's rather disturbing. (laughs) Tristan's got a a, a pastry bag, you know, full of blood. And he's like... (laughs) He's a chef, right? Another helpful guy that shows up is the builder. Yeah. And he says that he got the call to come and remove the screws, and he assumed it was Julia, right? Yeah. A mimic. He knew where the key was. Yeah. We know it was Evelyn calling. Yes. And Evelyn can sound just like Julia. You know how she does that? Ah! (laughs) Take the screws out of the liquor cabinet. I can't handle it anymore. Click. That's how he knew it was her. Exactly. Because that's what she always sounds like. So now we're headed (laughs) to the climax of the episode, which involves Evelyn taking some pills and getting ready to talk to Barnaby. Mm Mm-hmm. Because Julia's in the asylum now. 
Boonie she, Boonie. She's off with the I love myself jacket in the padded room out of the picture, which means everybody that was involved in the conspiracy is taken care of, right? Yes. Because... So there's a multiple of conspiracies here. Because there is the conspiracy to kill Wainwright. Yes. Then there is the conspiracy to kill Gregory. Yes. And then there is the conspiracy to frame Annie. Yes. Okay. And under all of that is the conspiracy to suppress the fact that there is a second will. And there were a number of people involved with all of those. Really, Wainwright and his inability to shut up caused all of this problems. <laughs> right? Because if he had, they had to go, is there a second will? And he went, mm-mm, which was more convincing right there than what he did. Yeah. <laughs> No, he goes, <laughs> you know, um, like a Scooby Doo villain. Of, none of that would have happened. But then there's a conspiracy, right? So Evelyn gets Evelyn gets boy. That's what he's called in the in the show notes, right? Yeah, boy, boy on motorcycle gets him to deliver the mushroom. Mm-hmm. Okay, and she gets Claris to drop off the death threats. So. There is an unwitting conspiracy here, but there's a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. There, there's everybody's conspiring against everybody else. Evelyn manages to kill Tristan, Kenneth, and Susanna without ever touching them. Without ever touching them. Without being near them when it happened. Right? She gets Boy to to add the mushrooms to Gregory's basket, which she claims if they hadn't been so callous as to eat the mushrooms that Gregory picked the morning that he died. Oh, she has. So does that, does that mean that Tristan kills Gregory, takes his little basket and takes the basket home? Yes. Or are these mushrooms? He does. Oh, that's even worse. They're they're horrible people. So he's carrying a trash bag of body parts and a little wee basket of mushrooms. Okay. This is what must be in... Tristan's inventory. They both <laughs> safety arrows, an inflatable raft, a bag with hands and head in it, a rope, a rope, a basket of mushrooms, basket of mushrooms, and the body because he has to carry the body too. That's true because the pond is not right next to where he was shot. Yeah, like that's a lot for Tristan to carry, even with those fancy stomach muscles of his. <laughs> Maybe the feather made him super strong. Super strong. It's like his power up or something. Because <laughs> he is like a video game character whose inventory is far larger than they could actually carry. Completely. <laughs> so Evelyn lays it all out. Woody comes in and she says, Woody, can you join us later? Poor Woody. I know. He's like, something's going on. Uh, Carl Rainwind is Annie's father. I wrote the script. I figured it all out. It's, it's She just lays it all out. Yeah. And we find out that the will is giving everything to Annie, Mm -hmm. the second will. And we find that out at Tristan's bedside because he keeps it. The smartest thing that Tristan ever did was say, well, she killed one husband and she killed her boss. (laughs) She might kill me. (laughs) But I would still go out with her if I wasn't dying. I would just want this insurance policy of this second will just in case. I kept it here hidden in my... Hotel bed. My hospital, hospital bed. bed. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure how that works. It's convenient because if it was hidden somewhere else, he would have had to go, okay, Tom, see, here's what you do. You walked into the woods, you go to the third tree on the left, you look over, you kind of, you know, like... You find my ginormous pack. Yeah. I just happen to have put it right here under the mattress. Yeah. And Nurse Ratchet hasn't found it yet with her secret phone. Yes. Evelyn dies. And... and it's and, sad. And our understanding is that her motive for all of this is because she thinks Annie's been done hard by. Yes. And she cared for Gregory. So Annie is not crazy Tyson's daughter. No. So he's out of the picture, right? All of the conspirators are out of the picture. Oh, okay. So hold on. So let's finish off the episode before we get to after the episode. No, I know, but it's... So what Evelyn has done is freed Annie up from all the people who had either done wrong by her or she's revenged Gregory, which I guess she's trying to do both. And she does both. But I don't know why she cares about Annie so much. I mean, I I feel bad for Annie, but it's not like Annie is Evelyn's daughter. I think she's sad that Annie was never legitimately talked about as Wainwright's daughter. Oh, so you think Evelyn has always known that Annie was Wainwright's daughter? Yeah. 
I I don't think I knew how long Evelyn had known I'm that. I'm not sure, but that's all but I got. I think we can assume that she's known for a while. She's older. She's been in the village longer. She has a cane. Yeah. Canes are super. Exactly. So she dies, and then they put her in an ambulance, and then Clarice's outfit goes from bad to worse. Yeah, she's gone from frump to, here's my belly button. <laughs> and it's like two shots, but obviously the actress is not happy about that. <laughs> I don't know. It's just not right. She's an inconsistent character. She left a note for Woody, and Woody reads it, which is the saddest thing well, ever. Clarice reads it to him because he doesn't yeah. have his glasses. How am I supposed to be happy now? It's just so terribly and upsettingly sad. I like your idea that Woody and Marcus from a previous episode should get together and start... A tractor business. A, a riding lawnmower tractor business or at least like maybe they could have races maybe Mm. i think they'd be best buddies i think they would too they have a lot in common (laughs) yeah (laughs) our wives are a little crazy and now they're both dead so let's be friends and weird younger people who live in the house Mm -hmm. really there is yeah they actually have a lot in common they're playing croquet in the backyard yeah so tom and joyce are in the backyard playing some croquet because now she's the master of croquet because she ran a stall for an hour Right, so she knows all about Tom it. Tom didn't bring the new sign. And she says that Evelyn is a mass murderer. What do you think about that? Okay, mass murderer is usually characterized by killing over three people at one time. That's what, from, from what I understand, mass murderer, you kill everybody at the same time. So if Susanna had made the van explode with... Claris and Evelyn and Punch. Let's give him credit. He's a person. Yeah. If that exploded and all three of them died, then she would be a mass murderer just for killing those three people. I, it's got to be three or more. I would say it's got to be more than three. I mean, like I'm thinking like ten. Okay. Let's say five. Five. You killed five people at one time and at once. Yeah. Right. If you do them one at a time, you're a serial killer. Yeah. Right. If there's time between it. That's the whole point of Serial is that there's... It's a series. There's, there's a ramp up the event and then a ramp down and then a ramp up again. Yeah. So she... she Mass murderers don't do that. She enjoys poisoning Tristan and then that wears off. So she's got to do something to Kenneth and then yeah. that wears off, right? So like... So she's not a behavior. serial killer. She's, she's not, not a, a serial... No, she's neither. She's a revenge killer. And I mean, okay, let's say Evelyn doesn't die. If she had to go to court... Do you think she'd even be convicted since she didn't actually do it? It would be really difficult. I mean, Julia killed Susanna. Well, I think she doesn't want to go to court because it would mean Claris and Boy would be charged with murder. Yeah, at least conspiracy. Yeah, so that that's why I think she kills herself. Is she takes all the blame. And she's ailing and she's not happy the fact that she's not as capable as she used to be. She can't do things anymore. She's clearly frustrated with that. But I just think you certainly can't call her a mass murderer. So I don't think Joyce is right there. No, Joyce has it wrong, but she's really mean to Tom when he's trying to hit the ball. She is. (laughs) It's rude. So Evelyn might be gone. Maybe Woody will have a new friend. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, oh, he's stuck with Claris. I'm, oh. uh, and those puppets. Oh. I can only imagine those puppets would be really upsetting to him after Evelyn's death. I would assume so. And, and Claris even more so because yeah. she's creepy. So best corpse of the episode. Mm, tough one. We have... The following deaths to consider, right? We see Carl mm-hmm. Wainwright. We see Gregory's dead body. Well, no, we, we see, see him, him fall. Yeah, fall. we don't see a dead body. We, we see his hand. We, I guess you could count that. We don't see Tristan die. No. Ken Gooder's we hand. See his hand. Susanna, she's up against the wall dead. Yeah, spatter and everything. So of dead bodies, we really have... Carl in the coffin. Susanna against the wall. Yep, and that's it. We see Evelyn sort of look like she falls asleep. Yeah. So I, I got to go with Suzanne. I think Suzanne's probably the best uh, corpse also. Yeah, though Carl does a good job of laying perfectly still in that coffin. 
It's kind of easy. You kind of press against the sides. So you don't have to move or anything. Yeah, but he's got Susanna and Tristan making out like crazy people over him. But it doesn't matter because, and we'll talk about this in just a second, next week's episode. <laughs> Dude, it is Oscar level dead body acting next week. <laughs> yeah, I think Susanna wins the, the best body of the episode. So and want, maybe the most deserved body of the episode, yes. too. So we want to add a segment here of what happens after the episode. We'll call it after the credits. After the credits, what happens in this story? Because Annie has now inherited the estate. Yes, the hotel and everything. So she doesn't have to worry about a job, but she has no idea. No. Like, how to run an estate. No. Or well, the she hotel. Might, she might know how to run the grounds, but she, yeah, she has no business acumen as far as we know. No. Julia is off in La La Land somewhere. Well, she's committed. Yeah. Woody, and if she wasn't, she'd be on trial. Woody has lost his wife and lives in the house with creepy Clarice. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's it. Like, or, oh, um, Annie's father, Tyson... It's revealed that he's not his fa- not her father. So that's a complex relationship already that just got another wrapper of com- complexity around it. Yeah, so let's let's put this all together. What does Annie have to live with after all this is said and done? She's inherited a hotel. She has no idea how to An run. An estate. Yeah, yeah, she's pregnant. Yeah. The father of that baby was murdered and his head and hands were cut off. Yes, that's it. Her- a- Interesting story to tell the child. Mm -hmm. Her dad isn't her dad, and her real dad was murdered. And then a friend of her family, a friend of hers, Evelyn, has killed four other people on her behalf. On her behalf. Yeah. That's an interesting story to tell a 19-year-old. There's therapy in her future. Yeah. (laughs) I hope. (laughs) Shooting some pheasants is not going to help her get through all that. Mind the pheasants. <laughs> I but, get, it's not a happy ending. But I think maybe, maybe it is a happy ending because I think, I bet you, the fate was held there next year. <laughs> yeah, that little couple who come up to Susanna after the funeral, who she says, well, you better find someplace else to have the fate next year because it's not going to be here. They're like, huzzah. Yeah. <laughs> I think Two people are happy at the end of the episode. A place for our ferret races. <laughs> okay, next episode is going to be season four, episode three, The Electric Vendetta. We have UFOs and the greatest dead body acting of all time. Yes. It's Oscar level. Really, corpse. between these two episodes, there is more naked old man ass than ever before. <laughs> <laughs> they sat down and they went, what are we going to do this season that's going to really make it different from last season? Middle-aged naked man ass. More naked hairy butts. That's going to do it. That's going to bring in the viewers. There's hair to be talked about. Let me tell you. It gets our vote, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, on social media, we are at Midsummer Maniacs on Twitter and Instagram. And we're found on Facebook on the uh, Facebook group and the Acorn TV group, who have been all absolutely awesome for us, as well as the Reddit Midsummer Murder subreddit. Mm-hmm. So if we're easy to find. If you're trying to get a hold of us, also send email to midsummermaniacs at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. We just passed another milestone of craziness that I cannot even believe. I would have even imagined us getting that far in a year of podcasts, and we're already there. 4,000. 4,000 listens. Yeah, I'm I'm still thinking that's wrong because I can't believe how many it is. It's insane. 4,000 listens in 14 episodes. Thank you all so much. It's so much fun. Crazy, amazing. Tell all your friends. Tell all the maniacs you know. Tell everybody. Oh, next week's going to be a doozy. Oh, uh, Hold on to your croquet mallet. It certainly is. <laughs> so until then. It's time for ufology, man. <laughs> ufology. Ufology. All right. Have a good week, maniacs. Bye, maniacs.
it's going to sound like something really bad happened because we were like, <laughs> and in silence. We do that all the time. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but there's a lot of time where we're like, ha, 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 ha. total strange offshoot, serious <laughs> thing. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I got to mix these two together. Are we recording? Mm-hmm.